Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, can you, I don't know if we're live now, um, but hopefully we are. Um, if you are in here, I'd like to say welcome to our Site Point webinar with Alex Walker. Alex? Um, he is our design channel editor and will be speaking to us today about stock images. Um, this webinar is sponsored by Graphic Stock, who are currently running a competition where you could win $5,000 for designing an 80s themed movie um, poster. So if you would like to um, be involved, definitely jump in. You have a chance of winning money. I would highly recommend it. But over to Alex now, who will start um, a presentation to help you get there and learn everything that you need to know about stock photography. Okay. Enjoy. Okay. Hello everyone, um, welcome to my presentation. It's called the uh, Stock Imagery Survival Guide. Um, and I'm just gonna kick it up now. I'm gonna start the presentation. If I start my little, this is software here actually, I have to kick it into a different window. Present. And put that into a window. Share screen. That looks good. And we are good. Are we, share, are we sharing screens? I think we are. And let's hit play. Okay, let's get started. As a uh, Angela introduced me. I'm Alex Walker and I'm the design channel editor for uh, sitepoint.com. And this is the stock imagery survival guide. And quick shout out to the sponsors again, Sitepoint and Graphic Stock and 99designs for their help with this. So let's get started. The, we're gonna cover three sections today. The first section is called uh, the need to know of, need to knows of copyright. The second section is called I found this really cool image, can't I just change it a bit? And the third section is called three pro tips to finding the perfect image. So let's get started with the need to knows of copyright. Now we all license stock imagery at, at various times and there are many methods of licensing it, but there are probably four big uh, licensing methods. Um, we're gonna cover those four. We're talking about royalty free, creative commons, rights managed and extended enhanced licensing. So with all of those licensing methods, there are a set of rules that the artist defines and it's up to you to follow those rules and to make sure that you and your client don't get hit for improper uh, usage down the line. So royalty free is probably one that most of us have dealt with at some point. Uh, the license allows you to use the image multiple times without paying a royalty. It's the most lenient and in many ways easiest uh, form of licensing that you can use um, for both commercial and uh, personal projects. Royalty free is free to use but you can't claim ownership of the original work and most of the royalty free imagery out there, it comes from two main areas. There's amateur photography and clip art, and we've all sort of seen this stuff on um, uh, various sites like Flickr and the like. And there's also a lot of uh, royalty-free imagery out there that is public domain work. Uh, it is uh, stuff that is public domain, copyright has lapsed, 
a lot of it's even old books and uh, postcards and that kind of stuff. So um, that covers the majority of royalty-free uh, work. Oh. Oh, hang on. Oh. Well, let's hang on. Sorry about that. Oh. Um, how do I get it onto there? Do you? All right. Well, that means the camera will be there. That's fine. Um, we might actually roll back a little bit on that because apparently I've been broadcasting the wrong screen, so apologies for that. We'll move back to the start of the rules. Uh, Going back to the, the licensing of stock imagery, there are those four main areas, royalty-free, uh, creative commons, rights managed, and extended enhanced, in, enhanced licensing. Um, and those rules are set out by the artist, and it's up to us to uh, follow those rules to make sure that we don't get ourselves or our clients into uh, problems and, for, and get hit for improper usage. Uh, later down the line. Royalty free is one of the major areas that we um, we get a lot of our imagery and this licensing is probably the most lenient and uh, is used in both commercial and, and personal projects. It's free to use but you can't claim ownership of the original work. Most of the the royalty free imagery out there that we find comes from two main areas amateur photography and clip art and public domain work and copyright that has lapsed on work. So there's a lot of archival and uh, public domain, old books, that kind of stuff you find in royalty-free public domain um, area of imagery. Creative Commons is uh, a relatively new invention in terms of licensing and it's, it has a lot of benefits, but it's also very strictly laid out. It's free to use, but you must follow the rules set out by the license uh, of the original artist. Those rules include nearly always you must credit the creator. There's also some content uh, that may be modified, but sometimes you may not uh, have the permission to alter the original uh, piece of work. Often if you include someone's work in your newly created work, you aren't allowed, you have to, you have to continue that license of the original work in your work. So um, you can't change the licensing agreement from the original work. And also some um, licenses do allow for commercial use, but most don't. So even if you create the work with a view to not use it in a commercial sense uh, and that changes down the line, you can get into, into some trouble. Rights managed is uh, the, the kind of work, obviously, like graphic stock and the, the various um, commercial uh, places out there that license work and uh, stock imagery to people uh, like us designers. Um, rights managed is what you're dealing with in that situation and that license gives you exclusive time limited use of an image. Um, these images can only be used for one particular project and for a set period of time and quite often only in one specific uh, geographical area. Um, and then there's extended enhanced licensing and this licensing extends from your original license um, and that would allow you to use the original licensed piece of material on other things like, you know, if you bought it for use on a T-shirt, it would allow you to use the same piece of art on a book or a cup or a website or whatever that happens to be. Let's move on to part two. Part two is, I found a really cool image. Uh, I just need to change it a bit right, is what I'm calling this section. And the short answer to that question is no, unless you're feeling particularly lucky. 
So let's look at two real-world cases, and they're both fairly famous cases, so you might have come across them before, but I think they're worth going through anyway. Case one is a case called Ferry versus Garcia. And this guy, he's fairly famous, and if you're a designer, you probably already uh, are aware of Shepard Ferry. He's a street artist, and um, probably after Banksy, he's probably the, the most famous street artist on the planet. If you have seen this, his work, you would have seen probably this Obey sticker or hat or T-shirt. Uh, he does this big, bold, uh, quite sort of uh, almost Russian military-looking work. Um, and even if you don't know street art, you probably would have seen this poster uh, at times over the years. It's probably the most famous piece of work in the last 10 years, um, arguably. This guy is a guy called Manny Garcia, and he's a freelance photographer who works for the Associated Press most of the time. Back in 2006, he gave, uh, he went to a, a press conference that was set up by George Clooney, and uh, George Clooney was supporting Obama at the time, and Manny Garcia shot um, a series of photos, including this one. And if I lock off this little section here, you might start to get a slight sense of familiarity when you see it. If we put the two photos next to each other, you can see that there's not too much doubting that Shepard Ferry used that as the source of his piece of artwork, obviously making significant changes to that piece of art. Now, Shepard Ferry said uh, when they went to court that his historical inspiration was the well-known JFK portrait where he is posed in a three-quarters view, looking slightly upward and out into the distance. Uh, and this is the original piece of uh, the original poster that inspired Shepard Ferry. Manny Garcia said, um, "I've been on the campaign for 20-something months, so I would see the artwork, I would photograph it, and think, what is it with this image? But it didn't snap. It never occurred to me it was my image or my picture." Um, the Associated Press, nevertheless, took Shepard Ferry to court on behalf of Manny Garcia. And the verdict was that Associated Press won, and Shepard Ferry eventually had to settle to, for two years probation, 300 hours of community service, and a fine of $25,000. So uh, that little oversight, and obviously Shepard Ferry significantly changed that art. Nevertheless, he was hit pretty hard, and most of us would not like to see $25,000 fines uh, laid across our head. The second case is Coons versus or Rogers versus Coons. This guy is Jeff Coons, and again, he's a pretty famous artist, a sculptor, and he calls himself an appropriation artist. And he's also the world record holder for the highest auction price paid for artwork of any kind by a living artist, and that uh, amount is $58 million. And it's for this stainless steel orange balloon dog. But earlier than that, he made this sculpture. Back in 1988, he made a ceramic sculpture called String of Puppies. And it looked exactly like this, which is a photo that was taken, well, not exactly like this, but very close to this. It's a, a, puppy, that was a puppy photo that was taken back in 1985 by a guy called Art Rogers. And it was used on greeting cards and postcards and the like. And if we put them next to each other, you can see that it's not an exact pixel replica, but there's no doubt that, um, that uh, Mr. Coons had seen this image and had used this image as the basis for his piece of artwork. Now, Jeff Coons argued at the time in court that it was fair use that he'd created a new, more valuable piece of artwork by changing and adding to the original. And the court said that they replied that it's not fair use if the average person would recognise that the image was a copy of the other. So Jeff Coons replied with his defence team that it was parody, that the artwork was poking fun at the banality of society. And the court responded with by saying it wasn't parody, that parody would need to be poking fun directly at Art Rogers, and since uh, it wasn't, it was poking fun at society in general, that it didn't qualify as parody. So once again, the verdict was that Art Rogers won and Jeff Coons paid Rogers an undisclosed cash settlement. It was believed to be quite a large one. 
And on top of that, he pay, was ordered to pay one of the string of puppy sculptures uh, to uh, Art Rogers, which was valued at $400,000 at the time, and that was back in 1992. So if he still owns that sculpture, who knows what it could be worth. Um, all up, Coons could have licensed that puppy's image for $50, and, and basically the takeaway is that if you're in any doubt, just buy a license. Let's move on to part three. Three pro tips for finding the perfect image. I think this is a little bit more fun. Tip one is work on good copy first. Killer copy can make a fairly ordinary image great. And as an example of this, this is a Volkswagen print ad from 1960. And as you can see, it's a ver very stock standard image of a car. There's uh, nothing particularly interesting about the composition or the layout or the lighting or the background or anything like that, but brilliant copywriting forces you to do a double take when you see it. And the, uh, the copy is simply the word lemon and you know, nearly anyone would see that and need to read the rest to find out why they had that word underneath that piece of uh, that particular image. And the supporting copy explains how a small blemish caused this car to fail Volkswagen's quality testing. And as this second example, here's exactly the same Volkswagen image but just scaled down and put into a, a huge amount of white space. Um, at the time, Time magazine, which is you know, probably the largest magazine in the world, charged $6,000 for a full page ad. And few, very few CEOs or art directors were brave enough at that stage to leave 80% of a $6,000 page blank, but Volkswagen had the guts to do that. And their ads were a huge part of Volkswagen's break into that US market in the uh, late 50s, early 60s. So clever copywriting and layout makes an ordinary image great. Tip two is identify the cliches and then twist them and bend them and break them. Now those cliches might include the subject matter that you're using, the camera angles, the typography, the colour and the styling. Example one is how does Levi jeans stay young and hip and, and keep in mind that Levi jeans is about 120 years old as a company so it's quite a task to keep a brand like that young and hip. The standard cliche is to show young hip people in denim but their twist was to find stock photographies, uh, photographs of sheep and run with a stand out from the flock theme. And this is the ad that they've been using or they've used relatively recently with lots of these white sheep all heading in one direction and one black sheep heading against the flow. This is probably 10 or 20 minutes worth of Photoshop. It could be in a real photo, but I don't believe that they actually found a black sheep to sit in the middle of this flock and head in the other direction. So a really effective ad, sort of ad that would stick out in the middle of a fashion magazine or, or um, any other situation that you would normally find a Levi ad in. Example two is how does pedigree dog food promote the idea of dog adoption? And the cliche is to take the view of, please help us take care of all the sad puppies. But their twist is to start with this image on one side of the page, which is a very sad and forlorn and stressed looking guy. Um, the, the black clouds above it are sort of bearing down on him and it's a windswept beach and you have to wonder what has gone wrong with this guy's life, what's the stress and, and hassle um, that this guy is, is, uh, is dealing with. And on the other side of the page is this photo, and this is obviously the original that had a dog in it. And when we look at it, we can realise that the guy was actually just playing with his dog and they just photoshopped out the dog from the, the, uh, the first image and they've run with the tagline, a dog makes your life happier, adopt. So they've actually switched it around to be take care of yourself rather than take care of the dog, which is a pretty clever approach. And again, this is taking a stock image, maybe they actually photographed this, but you could probably find a stock image that would work in the situation. And they've run with 10 minutes of Photoshop to get rid of the dog and they've got a really effective ad and a great image. 
And example three is how does the, how the Worldwide Wildlife Fund protect the Arctic? And the cliche is to say, look, aren't polar bears cute? And let's face it, they are. Look at them there. But their twist is to take the polar bears and to Photoshop on this, this graffiti. And there's something just really nasty about this whole image, you know, the the white of the bears in the background and that kind of thing um, makes it really difficult to kind of look at. Funny thing is with this image is the saddest looking bear is the one at the back and um, he almost looks like he wants the tough tats that are been sprayed onto the other bears. <laughs> anyway, that's only my take on it. But yeah, their, their take is to deface the bears and break the white of the background and the another 10 minute photo shop job to, to turn out a, a brilliant image. And tip three is embrace the weird or at least a touch of the weird. And I'm going to just jump into a little story here about two gentlemen and the first man is a guy called Ellerton Jett who is who was the president of Hathaway Shirts back in the 1950s. Hathaway was a about a hundred year old company at that stage. It started out as a small company and it was still a small company of about 15 people in 19, in the mid 50s. Um, and this guy is a guy called David Ogilvy, who is to this day a legend in the, the advertising industry. Um, if you're not aware of him, you might be aware of this guy. Uh, this is Don Draper from the Mad Men series, and David Ogilvy is pretty much the original Don Draper. Um, he was the kind of guy who, if you could get him to run with your account and do your advertising, he could make your company you know, a success, basically, just by how good he was. So um, Hathaway had a very small marketing budget and it was the kind of marketing budget that would uh, normally be overlooked by Ogilvy but um, Ellerton Jett was smart enough to approach Ogilvy and say he would give him two guarantees saying that he would never change Ogilvy's copy and that he would remain an Ogilvy and Matthew client for life and that was enough to get Ogilvy on board. He agreed to take on the Hathaway account. So Ogilvy's idea was pretty stock standard in a lot of ways. He went for the sophisticated man of the world, almost like a James Bond figure, maybe an older James Bond, in a rich, luxurious setting. And uh, he threw in one little twist. On the way to the photo, shop, uh, the photo shoot, he picked up a 50 cent eye patch. And about halfway through the photo shoot, he threw it to the model and asked the guy to put it on. Now, why an eye patch? Ogilvy's view was that the eye patch was there because it changed the photograph from a pro from a product shot into a story. And it's true that you can't help wondering who is that guy? How did he lose his eye? Was he in the war? Is he a spy? What's going on with the eye patch? And how did he get to where he's going? And what's going on? Um, and they ran with that eye patch idea for years to come and it, it's quite comical to look at these days. Uh, here he is with a cello and this is the one I love, doing calculus or some kind of crazy mathematics on the background, on the blackboard behind and having a Chianti and a sandwich and here he is looking at a shotgun and composing music and these ads ran for years. Here he is playing chess and even when they changed models they stuck with this whole crazy eye patch idea and it became you know, like a, a brand asset. Ridiculous, stagey, goofy, absolutely, particularly to our eyes now, but Hathaway became the number two shirt company in the States and um, Ellerton Jett stuck with his promise and stayed with Ogilvy and Matha until Jett retired in the 80s. One more example of embracing the weird, Scrabble are a really smart company and their marketing team are very clever and they have great imagery and their tiles and the, the wooden tiles, the little plastic tiles I think they are now, uh, are very iconic and they're a great visual asset and they were using those for years and still do sometimes in their ads. But recently they started to break away from that whole idea of using the game pieces 
And here you can see just an incredible image if you come across it in a magazine. How they even start with a stock image of a, an apple of an elephant and start breaking it up into sections. These meaty parts in between the elephant, I'm not sure how you do that, but that's an incredible image. And they also do a lot of word puns that really must appeal to the people who play Scrabble. They're really clever um, little visual ideas. And this one, obviously, Crow and Bar put together, um, which is something that you would do in, in the game of Scrabble to uh, extend a word to get points. And this one's particularly disturbing. There's something about those spiky bits on that kitten that where we change cat into caterpillar and pen into penguin. Um, really clever stuff, and it's the sort of thing that if you come across it in a magazine, it's hard not to look at it and, and really wonder what you've come across. So Scrabble combines easy to source stock photos and cute word puns and some pretty slick Photoshop manipulations into a result that, that is a very memorable image. So recapping those three tips, uh, work on great copy first before you start working on the imagery. Identify the cliches and, and break them and embrace the weird or at least a little bit. And that pretty much covers it for today. Um, as I said, I'm Alex Walker from SitePoint. I'm the design and UX editor. And um, thanks again to SitePoint and to Graphic Stock and to our friends at 99designs for uh, helping us out today. And thanks for reading, watching, and listening. And I'll now stop sharing the screen. I might swap back to Angela. I think we're going to take some questions. Yeah. So if anybody has any questions, please feel free to add them into the chat. Um, I will ping them across to Alex so he could answer them. Alex, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very informative. I love the Scrabble dictionary uh, combination there. Um, so yeah, it was very insightful. Thank you very much. So we do have a question. Um, Alex? Yes. Where do you find inspiration when embracing the weird? Photo uh, inspiration, that is. <laughs> I think the ad ad teams of the world, the there's a, a site called um, I think it's called adsoftheworld.com that brings a lot of this stuff together. Uh, I think the smartest imagery people on the planet work for the still work for magazines and for TV commercials. So um, that is one of the places that I go to. And also, just the more you understand the cliches, I think the easier it is to take those cliches as a starting point and then jump as far as you can in the opposite direction. For example, the the Levi guys just looking through a magazine and, and seeing what the standard uh, responses are in there to people pitching ads, it's beautiful people in beautiful areas and to suddenly throw um, you know, the image of sheep in amongst that, it's very hard not to, um, to sort of do a double take when you see that sort of thing. So uh, I think that's a pretty good place to start but um, yeah, I think that's probably the, uh, the way that I take, um, that's the approach that I take. Excellent. So Cassandra has a question for you. What are some of the best resources for getting reasonably priced exclusive stock photography? I think in, in many ways um, one of the things that I know some people do is they, they actually put one day a month aside for actually going out and shooting their own stock. One of the best ways of getting reasonably priced stock photography and um, is to simply build your own library. That doesn't happen very quickly, but before you know it, quite often, if you've been doing it for a few years, you'll all of a sudden have this. Um, you know, you will have built up quite a large library of of stock um, just by you know thinking, okay, I'm going to the market today. 
let's keep an eye open and and sort of pick stuff up. So I know a couple of people that just set aside maybe the first of the month each month and and do that kind of thing. Certainly our sponsors are Graphic Stock, so um, and I know that they've got a great selection and they are very reasonably priced. So um, it would be a miss to, of me to uh, not mention Graphic Stock in amongst that. So um, definitely worth a look. Excellent. And once again, as I mentioned earlier, this webinar is being sponsored by Graphic Stock, who are currently running a competition with Site Point, um, where you can win up to five thousand um, dollars for designing a themed movie poster. So definitely get in there. I will speak more information about that. Um, our Site Point Twitter account has been promoting the event for a little while. So if you follow Site Point on Twitter, um, you'll find those links. Otherwise, definitely. Um, look for it. Um, I'll be live tweeting it anyways. So, um, do we have any other questions? Yes, Cassandra has asked, what software storage or way to organize all of those thousands of photos? I'm using Google Photos at the moment. Um, I, it, it has facial recognition and it's pretty clever. You can even type in things like, um, you know, ball or bar or denim and things like that, and it, it's pretty good at um, processing and, and looking at uh, and recognizing objects in um, in your photos. And it gets better and better over the years. It's amazing um, how clever it is. Plus, it, it's pretty cheap, even if you're paying for. I think it might be five or ten gig that is the default, but to extend, expand it to larger um, uh, storage capacity, it's pretty. Um, cheap. I think it's something like five or ten dollars a year. So definitely worth worth working with. Excellent. Thank you for that, Alex. Um, so some of you are asking if this video is going to be available um, afterwards. This will be available to replay. I will tweet a link to it as soon as it is out. If you have received any of our email promotions, um, we'll definitely be setting up another one with the link to this webinar so that you can access it. Um, you can take notes. If you have taken notes, if you haven't, that's okay because you can just replay this video and grab all those notes again. Um, do we have any other questions before we sign out? Yes, we do. What photo equipment, Canon versus Nikon, would you recommend? Uh, I'm a Nikon user myself, so um, but if you've got a, a really good camera, that's that's worth doing. But the problem with um, uh, you know having a great camera is, do you have it with you all the time? So, what the, the quality of photography that you can get with a good camera phone these days is still well worth running with. So, um, I almost. If, if you know you're going to take photos, yeah, great. Bring your, your DSLR, but um, don't overlook a really good camera phone. Um, you know, anything from an iPhone 5 on is going to give you quality photography, and it's just almost a matter of being aware of what you're looking at all the time. Sometimes uh, I, there was a stage there where I'd get home and then think, oh, no, wow, I just went, was, you know, had this amazing view, or I was camping and there was, you know, a great stream. And I forgot to photograph it, and I'm, I've got a little um, flag in the back of my head now that kind of picks up that where I'm somewhere with, where there is imagery that I, I might be able to take that will be useful at a later date. So um, that's almost a, a habit thing. Okay. So another question has come in: How do you decide what you can Photoshop without getting into trouble? Um, I guess it's one of those things that if you have any doubt at all, it's usually pretty cheap to just find a pretty close image. I mean, it's so easy to sit there, and sometimes I'll sit there in um, you know, Google image search and just find something that's close, but for what it's worth, it's, it's 10 or $20 often to register an image or to license an image. I've had a couple of things that have come back to bite me, and they were things where I actually did the right thing even, but if you get letters from lawyers, it's nasty, so uh, it's just simpler most of the time to just pay a small amount of money and keep yourself out of trouble. Um, if you've got 
if you're asking yourself the question, there's probably a pretty good chance that you're, um, you've got a problem or you may potentially have a problem. The thing is that most of the time, maybe every 50 things, 49 of them will be great. No one will care, but that 50th will give you a headache that will pursue you for months. So, um, yeah, probably just do the right thing. You never know which one it's going to be that sort of bites you. Um, the, the one that I had the biggest trouble with, where I had overseas solicitors writing letters to me, was one where I'd actually registered the, registered the image even through a site. So, um, yeah, try to do the right thing. <laughs> Would you get in trouble if you took a picture similar to one that already exists? Uh, well, I guess Jeff Koons um, definitely made a sculpture of an image that already exists. So I guess with someone like Jeff Koons, he's a guy who's pretty famous, so the chances of the original artist seeing it are very high. And he's also got a lot of money, so... Um, Maybe he might be different from us in that people won't be pursuing him. Uh, well, people would be pursuing him more than they would with us because there's a, a lot to gain. Um, so yeah, you you could certainly get into trouble. Uh, the problem that I that we had um, was where we registered a rocket image for a book cover, and we paid for it through a well-known site, um, and it was a pretty generic-looking 50s-style rocket. And we about it was probably about 12 months later got a letter from the Tintin people saying that um, uh, that we'd infringed their copyright and that we had to pay them 5,000 euros or whatever it was. And um, it was a 3D model that someone else had made that they'd based on the, the Tintin red rocket. So um, it wasn't even Tintin or any of the major characters. It was a a, um, a set piece, really, from two of the 24 um, Tintin original books. So uh, that was certainly not the, you know, I, I'm sure that I did things that were closer to the line than that over the years. But, um, uh, yeah, definitely, even when you do the right thing, you can sometimes have things bounce back on you. Yeah. So what is your say about those artists who sketch the photos or paint photos that belong to somebody else? Is that also considered illegal? Uh, yeah, I think I, I think if the, it's one of those things, again, if you're starting to make significant money out of it, uh, there's a, every extra dollar that you make out of out of an image that's based on someone else's image, the chances of them coming after you uh, increase with every dollar. So and that's exactly what's happened with both uh, Shepard Fairey and Jeff Koons. Obviously, they're, they're famous and there's good reasons to chase them, probably more cha uh, chances than um, you know, people actually pursuing us. But that also means that... that the day that we, any of us, get something right and something goes really well and we're in the habit of using things and not licensing them or not properly following the licensing conditions, you know that your success is going to be um, uh, impinged upon by people that are coming to, to take their pound of flesh. So um, definitely keep that in mind if you've got something that looks like it's going to go well. Even at that stage, it might be worth trying to go back and register it retrospectively if, if you get into that situation. I'm not sure if that is going to stand up in court, but um, you know, it'd probably still be worth trying. Although I think Art Fairy tried to change or manufacture some imagery that he said he based his Obama picture on, and then they discovered that that wasn't the case, and he got into even more uh, trouble. So um, that is, uh, yeah, definitely you can get yourself into some big problems very quickly. Okay. Um, and if I did want to register an image, well, how can I do that? Where can I go? How can I crack into the market? Could you give me some tips about that? Um, most of the time, the, the process of simply purchasing it through uh, one of the stock sites, obviously part of signing up to that site and um, agreeing to their terms and conditions is um, means that you have officially licensed that photo, um, uh, free use imagery um, and uh, public domain uh, imagery, one of the problems with that sometimes is that things that are um, 
you know, officially licensed by other people can sometimes get uploaded to um, free use sites and, and um, public domain sites without actually being public domain. So there's always, there's not such a motivation for someone to check uh, the imagery that's been labelled as, um, as free to use. Um, so you can even get into problems with that if, if uh, imagery is being uploaded that wasn't supposed to be and isn't um, licensed to be uploaded to those sites. And so does that mean that for all the photographs that you take, you are the owner of your own photos or is there um, something else to consider? No, if you're the creator, if you've taken the photo, mm -hmm. unless arguably if you have taken a close-up photo of the Mona Lisa, then you're probably, your photograph isn't, um, uh, you don't now own the, the rights to the um, to the, the image of the Mona Lisa or anyone else's artwork. So you get some shady areas where it might be a photograph of street art where someone else has created that art or, or um, uh, you know, any situation where you're photographing someone else's work, there's there's your interpretation of their work and um, there's their original work and uh, there's always going to be a grey area in there. So um, if you are standing in front of someone else's street art um, and you're photographed in front of that, that's a photograph of you in front of some art. So yeah, there's there are a lot of grey areas in this kind of stuff. So it's and I'm certainly not a lawyer. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I wouldn't want to be giving people too much advice on um, on, on that stuff, but um, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine there are a lot of um, legal implications um, and bits that we're not aware of. Yeah. Um, thank you for answering all those questions. By the way, um, for everybody out there watching this webinar, if you're not familiar with Alex Walker, he does present, uh, he does release a weekly newsletter. Um, from SitePoint, a design newsletter. So if you like reading design, it's one of my favorite newsletters that I like to read as well, um, personally. Um, I would highly recommend going to sitepoint.com forward slash newsletters and you can find a link to Alex's weekly um, newsletters if you'd like to subscribe to them. They're very, very insightful, always referring, um, referencing something that had happened in the past and relating it to design. It's really, really intriguing. Um, but yes, we are still open and available, so if you do have any more questions, please shoot them across right now. Um, if not, then I'd say it's safe to say thank you for attending the webinar and um, being active on chat. It was fun talking to you all. Um, let me just wait a couple of minutes to see if any more questions pop through. Alex, would you like to say anything in the meantime? Uh, no, well, just um, thanks for attending, everyone. This is the first time we've used this software, so um, we're still working it out. It seems to be pretty good, but yeah, give us some feedback on the software. It's called um, Webinar Jam, and we'd probably like to use it a little bit more in the future, but we're still working out the bugs a little bit, and this is the kind of thing we'd like to do a little bit more of, but um, yeah, we're still working out some of the rough edges, so... Um, Hopefully this wasn't too bad and that people enjoy it and we can um, even polish up our game as we as we work forward in the future. Excellent. Yes, please um, give us any feedback that you have on the software, on the webinar. If there's anything that we can do to improve the um, webinars, definitely let us know. We'd like to take that feedback on board and make it even better for you next time. We do have a few more webinars coming through, so keep your eyes peeled for them. Um, one hosted by Graphic Stock and a couple more by a few more SitePoint contributors. So um, definitely make sure that you monitor our um, Twitter accounts to see what events are coming up um, because we're just this is the first webinar that we've hosted and we're just going to um, present more and more of them. More of them. So. Um, as mentioned, you will have a link available if you've um, subscribed through email. Another email will be sent through with those links. Aside from that, we'll be tweeting the um, link to replay this video once it's available. Um, thank you all very much for attending and asking all your questions. They're all very interesting. Oh, um, I think one question has popped in quickly before we leave. Norm has asked, 
if I take a picture of a product, can the product owner state that I cannot use the picture on a website? Ooh, that's, well, I would think they can't. If you've actually purchased the product and you're photographed, then unless you're claiming, and <laughs> again, here I am being Mr. Lawyer, so, <laughs> so I hope this doesn't bounce back on me and I'm standing in a court at some point, but um, my um, I am not a lawyer uh, view on that one is, is if you've um, purchased the product, um, you own the product and you are allowed to photograph it. If you are using the the product shot as um, representing it in some kind of negative way, they might have some other um, way of uh, some problem with you in a, in a court environment. But if you are selling the product, presumably that's the only reason that you would, or promoting the product, I'm not sure why they would be um, not happy with you adding that image to your website. But um, yeah, that would be, I can't imagine that they would have any real case unless you were misrepresenting their product. So. Um, that's my best call on that particular um, question. Do you have any tips um, for our users who are interested in um, participating in the competition? Are there any photo usage tips that you have, um, anything that they could use to help give them that winning edge in that competition? Well, I think I said this in the newsletter that I'm not a judge in the competition and I'm obviously not eligible to, although I wish I was, it was, um, it seems like a fun competition, but um, probably if I was in the competition, I would take the view, I think there's two ways you can do it. You can take an 80s movie poster um, that already exists or an 80s movie and then try to do a new version of that. Now, to me, that seems like a hard ask. If you're trying to out-design the guy who designed the Footloose poster or the, the Raiders of the Lost Ark, poster and, and do a better version of that, that seems like a hard ask, ask to me. But to take a new movie, to take, I've seen a few people that have done Interstellar and um, Inception and things like that, and then take that back and reinterpret it in the 80s. Uh, someone did a great poster of her, the movie, with a, like a Vic-20 or a, a Commodore 64 as the central image, and um, I thought that was super clever. So, um, yeah, I would probably from my own personal point of view, take the view that updating, or well, backdating a, a new movie with an 80s style is probably the smart move because it, it just gives you more, um, it gives you a bit of an in-joke to play with and, and it, it gives you more room to do the best one of those ever, whereas you, you're probably not going to do a better Footloose poster than the original Footloose poster, for example. So, um, yeah, that would probably be my major piece of advice. Excellent. Oh, go on, sorry. Go. And Matt, lucky last on. question was, uh, Vimal asked if we, if you have a Google search images in your own blog site, um, can you use it? Like, what about using Google search images in your own blog site? Can you do that? Um, well, if you go to the panel at the bottom when you do a search on Google Images, there is a section that says usage, I think it's usage rights, um, that, that sorts Google Images by um, their licensing agreement, but that is only um, generated by a bot that goes through and tries to determine, um, it's a Google bot that tries to determine whether something is um, uh, you know, free or licensed or whatever. So. Uh, like all bots, bots make mistakes all the time. You know they, um, you know, get lots of things wrong. On when you're searching for things, you don't always get the right thing. So, uh, I would say no. You know that uh, Google image search is is probably just good for getting an idea of images in a particular area. Or if you, you know, if you want to understand what you know a, a, a Holden Commodore looks like or a particular car, then that's great. But um, reposting that stuff. Um, the chances of you getting caught doing it on a blog are not super high, but then again, the, the technology for, for linking and, and um, uh, you know, finding images online is getting better and better. You can do, uh, you can search for visually similar images through Google and, and another service called TinEye. So even if you think you're getting away with it now and that no one will care, maybe in a year, maybe in two years, there are you know, services that are 
crawling all over your website, finding stuff and um, going back to the owner and tapping them on the shoulder and saying, I can make you some money, you know, that kind of stuff. Maybe it's not a problem today, but, you know, who knows what's happening, what's going to happen in six months or 12 months or two years. So uh, we, none of us want to be tucking these problems into, our, into a back drawer and having them jump out on us later on. So, um, yeah, I would say be very careful with, with uh, Google Image Search and using the images you're finding in there. Excellent. And I think it's about time to wrap up. So thank you once again. I've said thank you so many times, but um, <laughs> that's it. I think I'll we can start thank taking questions. <laughs> uh, thanks for the presentation once again. And um, like mentioned before, this video will be available afterwards and I will be tweeting that link as soon as it becomes available. Um, I hope you didn't take too many notes because you can always replay this later. Um, but I hope you enjoyed the webinar and thank you, Alex, for joining us. Bye. Thank you.